Dean Stavridis, Jim, my friend, thank you very much for your kind words. When you call me and you ask that I come here, my wife and I, Aida, you know, were wondering whether you know, we can move for, for a full three months. And at my age, it's not easy to dislodge. But, uh, but I can tell you, it has been a delight. It has been absolutely wonderful to be in the Fletcher, with the Fletcher community, with the students, with the faculty. And uh, they put me on my toes. You know, I, and uh, it's, a great, it's a great, again, to be in such an intellectual setting. <laughs> when, we, when we talk about the Arab Spring, I think we all talk about it with excitement and trepidation. Excitement because we see a part of the world looking, seeking human dignity. A bit late, but again, uh, something we were all waiting for. Trepidation because we have been seeing things not going the right direction. Uh, and violence started to, to, be, to come to the fore. And what I want to do in just a few remarks tonight, and then we can have a conversation, is basically to put the Arab Spring in context. What, why we see what's happening, and what are the prospects for the future. In context means that this is just part of the human journey everywhere. People who have been seeking throughout centuries, throughout recording history, to find a way to live in peace and dignity. Uh, we need to understand that because we have, as you look backward, you, you, we have seen a lot of trepidation, a lot of violence, a lot, a lot of effort, I think, by the human family just to find out what are the modalities that would allow us all to live in the optimal mode, if you like, without killing each other, and where every one of us feel when he wakes or she wakes <laughs> up in the morning that they have the dignity she or he deserves. Uh, I want to recall you know, the European experience, you know, and we should not no, we, where we have gone through 30 years of war, where we have gone uh, through uh, sovereign states, empires before that. So the modality even of the social organization we, we can live under has been, has been changing, and we have been experimenting with that, starting from the city-state during the Rome, the, uh, Athenians or the Greeks to, to empires, then empire didn't work, then we, you know, we had in 1648 the Peace of Westphalia and we said organize ourselves under sovereign states. Uh, then again, we had, we had wars, we had the Napoleon War, you know, and then we had to go back to the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and again trying to see not only sovereign states, but balance of power, you know. And that at the international level, but at the, at the national level also, we have seen revolutions, you know, major revolution. We, and the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, they have all been quite messy. And I think that's something we need to remember. We should remember that in, after the French Revolution and with Egalité, Liberté, Fraternité, came the Reign of Terror, you know, came Robespierre, came uh, the, the king came back, empire came back. So it, it took the French, you know, almost like 
90 years until it attained the Third, third Republic when they started to stabilize. When we again went, we, we look at the American Revolution. Again, it took you five years to agree on a constitution, seven years to get the Bill of Rights, if I'm, my numbers are, are correct. And it took you a civil war, you know, where 600,000 people lost their life. Over one of the issues which, again, we, we take it for granted that everybody is free, but it was not. You know, human dignity at that time was limited in scope and not to expand to everybody. Slaves were not part of that. And it has been a journey not only to define, as I said, how we live together, but what is exactly our scope of dignity. And that has been changing until today. I mean, what you see until today, new groups asking for rights, equalities, and it's a work in progress, in other words, what we, but which is normal because we do now understand better our, the world we live in, thanks to Steve Hawkins and others. Uh, and we also uh, try to understand our own self. Again, thank, thanks to the sociologists and Max Weber and sociology and everybody. So we, are, we should be modest in understanding that whatever we achieve you know, is is, is not really the final truth in, by, by any means. Uh, I should mention again that one more revolution, which is the Russian Revolution. And we, we again, you saw even before that, you have the Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks, great fights over, you know, can you, can you go directly into socialist state or do you have first to go through capitalism? Uh, then you got, of course, Trotsky. Then you got Stalin and Leninism. So, and of course, Stalin gulags were there, you know, waiting for the dissident. And the reds and the whites, you know. So you, the first point I think we need, to, we need to understand that revolutions are usually messy and chaotic. And uh, I should recall what JFK mentioned, that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And I think that is, that's exactly what happened in the Arab Spring before I get into the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, I was thinking this morning, covered the entire curriculum of Fletcher School. You know, <laughs> if I look at any course here, I can somehow link it to the Arab Spring. If you talk about law, diplomacy, business, negotiation, religion, you name it, you know, it's, it is there, you know, uh, which also is a tribute, frankly, to the Fletcher School Click and, and, and courses, because our world is such, so complicated. And what, what you see in every class I visit that you can apply, it's not only the theory, but we need to also understand the practice, you know. You cannot just sit here and theorize, but you need to see how that, that apply to practice, and in fact, not only apply to practice, but how you can improve the practice. Now, I think that's to me, is the value of, of the academic setting. Okay? And I will, I will again try, as I go through the few things that happened in the Arab Spring, is to highlight some of the intellectual issues we still have, we still have to discuss, you know, we still have to figure out. I wish there was 101 on revolution, there is none. You know? Uh, there is, you know, each, each people go their own direction, make their own mistakes. And I don't think people learn from pe other people's mistakes. Uh, the Arab Spring countries, if you like, and that's, you know, would have Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Syria, and at least so far, you know. Uh, they have all, if you look, have been coming out from at least four or five decades of repression a single dictator, you know. So it's, this is something we have to remember, that you just cannot move from a dictatorship, authoritarian system, with its culture, 
into democracy. Uh, because it's a democracy, again, I don't want to say that, in my view, I keep saying it's not instant coffee. It's, it's a culture, it's, it's a practice, uh, it's institutions. And all these people, you know, know exactly what they do not want. They do not want. But the day after, it was very difficult to get an agreement of what they want. I mean, surely, I mean, they, as at, at a large scheme, they wanted social justice, they want freedom. But how to go about that? That is, I think that's the issue where immediately after all this in these countries, the st people started to get polarized. And the state and institutions, fragile as they were, started to get fragmented. And once, once you get the state and institution fragmented, then people, they need their security blanket. And their security blanket has been, in the Arab world at least, ethnicity, you know, uh, religion, uh, sect, that is because they lost gradually, they lost identity with the state that was not, no longer there. Uh, in all these countries, there were of course different forces at work. There was the old regime, and the old regime was obviously looking, continued to fight uh, tooth and nail until, you know, uh, to keep their privileges. Uh, they have, you have the military, and that in certain countries is more active than others, but if the security services, I should, I should mention, that applies to all, uh, they have, you have the working class who really all they want, I mean primarily, is food on the table, is health care, is education. I mean, what we talk about is freedom of religion, freedom of expression. This is fine for them, but that's not really the number one priority. I mean, their priority until today is just how to make sure that they will have their basic economic needs, essentially, economic and social rights before civil and political rights. And civil and political rights, they don't miss it because they never had it. Also, we need to understand that. They never practiced democracy. And they have always been used to the idea that we need a, a leader you know, who will tell us what to do. They didn't have an alternative. They didn't see it. But they know that they want to take their kids to school, they want to take their wife to hospitals, and they want to have a job. Then you have the youth, people like most of you here, who really are not necessarily worried about ideology, uh, but primarily wanted a future. And these, and that, these are the guys who, and girls who give, give me hope because they are, at the end of the day, connected. I mean, the social networking has made an amazing change. I mean, everybody who's sitting in a small village somewhere in Libya or Syria or Egypt will know exactly what's happening in Boston and will know what's hap the demonstration that's taking place in New York. And will know, you know how green is the grass on the other, on the other side of the fence. So they, they wanted, these people are, they revolted because they knew they wanted a future. They wanted future for them, a job, a career, a family, a ability to move, mobile, to be mobile, you know. And they are, they are there, and they are the one who, in many of these places, triggered the, the uprising, uh, but they never been able after the uprising to get organized. And I think that's what is happening just across, across the region, that what you have is two big elephants in the room who were organized before and continue to be organized. One is the security services in different forms. In some countries, they are more sectarian, like in Syria, they are, or they are more, 
like in Yemen or, 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 or Libya, they are more, again, sectarian, I assume, Shiite and, you know, Shiite or versus Sunnis, militias more, you know, not necessarily an organized army, but they were, this is the security, the, the order, the stability that always existed before and has uh, uh, metamorphosis after, after the revolution in different shapes. And then, of course, you have the other one, the so-called Islamist, you know. And these are a garden variety of, of people, ranging from the Brotherhood, the Salafis, uh, all the way to ISIL and Al-Qaeda, you know. Uh, exactly what they, what they want is not very clear, but they have been mostly suppressed for like 60, 70 years. I mean, all the authoritarian system put them underground. And, and being underground also gives you the opportunity to be highly disciplined and highly organized. Uh, and they got, they got completely, well, they came with the message that let us go back to our days of glory when Islam was at the, its peak, 12th century, 11th century, and, and, and it, has, it was and continued to be, in many ways, a very appealing message, particularly that they have been repressed, suppressed, imprisoned. You know, and, uh, but they were, th these were the two, you know, the two big elephants that you will see them if you go through the entire Arab Spring countries. Uh, while you see the people who really triggered this whole thing completely now marginalized, uh, feeling depressed, lots of uh, brain drain, lots of, of them are leaving, uh, are leaving their countries. Uh, this is the society. It's a very fragmented society right now. It's very polarized societies right now. Uh, One of the issues, of course, again, we added to that, that post-revolution, there was no civil society, because civil society was not a welcome thing. And I, you have come to understand and to see it firsthand that without a civil society, you know, you cannot really move very fast or very far on democracy. Civil society means labor unions, uh, professional syndicates, uh, part, uh, political parties, NGOs. I mean, these are all have been suppressed and continue to be suppressed because a civil society is the kernel, obviously, of polar, polarity, is a, is a kernel of uh, democracy, is a kernel of inclusiveness. You know? And that added to the situation you see, you see today. It continued, and that's something should be of interest. <laughs> after, again, after all this uprising, there was the question, do you go for a revolutionary legitimacy or constitutional legitimacy? That's a question that never been answered one way or another. So you got in many countries calls that you have to move the old people of the old regime from political life for like five years or 10 years, they should be disbanded from political participation. It happened in certain countries, like in Libya, where they have been moved from the National Council. There was an, a law in Egypt to that effect, which was declared unconstitutional. In, in Tunisia, also the same, but it, 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 the law, the draft law was, was vetoed or rejected by every slim majority. But that's a question. What do you do with the old regime? You know, do you keep them in? And if you keep them in, uh, do, you, do, you, do you trust that they will not undermine the new regime? Uh, that's still a question, you know. A major, a major, other major issue, of course, is the, the Constitution, and that has been the basic law. And, and that really comes to the whole possibility of us anywhere able to live together. We need to agree on certain basic rules. I always say the Tea Party people the, and the American Civil Liberty Union, you know, don't really have much in common, but, but they still believe in the Constitution. And they still try to resolve their issues, you know, through the system. Right? Uh, that is 
has, has been one of the most difficult and continue to be one of the most difficult issues. How to get an agreement on the basic law, on the core values by which everybody, red, white, and black, you know, uh, Muslim, atheist, Christian, can live together. You know. uh, in Egypt today, I think I was counting this morning, we had eight different versions of the Constitution in three years. You know, mm. In a Constitution, then a draft the Constitution Declaration, then somebody else will change it. Uh, but it just to give you an understanding of the instability when you do not agree on, on the basic rule. And we still, in, in most of these Arab Spring countries, are vacillating between constitutions that have, as I call it, a religious flavor, or constitutions that have a military flavor. You know? And neither of them, of course, should be the, our ultimate objective. You know? uh, uh, with religious flavor mean that you know, the clergy should have the final say on the type of legislation. You know, if you like something like the Iranian model, you know. Uh, a military is one that gives military immunities in, in many areas and privileges and, and what have you. you know. uh, and that, that, as I said, that reflected the two power, power brokers that exist in most, because the third, which is the silent majority, if you like, I don't know what you call them, it's not the, it's not the Monday morning quarterbacks, but they're the large bunch who really trigger that, you know, are not yet organized to be able to say, we neither want to go this direction or that direction. We just want a basic law that respect core human values everywhere. And irrespective of whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a Jewish or, you know, it is the core values, you know, the core values right now, I think we all can agree are not different any longer. I mean, the Dalai Lama, I think that I saw him like a few months ago, and he said something which is continued to resonate with me. He said that the core values right now are secular values. Religion, different religion is icing on the cake, which I think is, summarizes exactly where we are today. That wherever you are coming from, there are certain basic values, sanctity of human life, decency, integrity, work ethics. Cannot, we cannot, irrespective of where you are coming from, if you are a Hindu or you, know, or you are a Puritan, you, know, you, still, you still should believe on that. And Nadim was telling me the other day, actually reminding me the other day, that in 17th century here in Salem, you know, the Puritans, in, in the name of Calvin, you know, had uh, witch trials. Hmm? Uh, where you know where women were were beheaded, you know, our history is not is not the greatest. As I said, it's still skin deep, you know. And if we we talk about democracy, as we even watch what's happening even here, we need to understand that we continue to support you know our values, and we need to create the environment and the checks and balances that make sure that we do not deviate from where we all want to go. And where we all want to go, as I said from day one, is basically to live in peace and basically to have human dignity as we continue to define it. Uh, I would simply say future prospects and then I stop. What we need in all these countries is transitional justice. Something similar to what you had in South Africa. You, know. uh, you need fact finding. You need a system of accountability, which is lacking quite a lot right now. You see a lot of people are losing their lives and nobody is held accountable, which, is, which makes the feeling, the sense of injustice, you know, even much worse. You know? And the, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, the day before yesterday, issued a very strong statement you know, about, about the state of accountability in Egypt. You know, and he basically talking about we should, deny, we should stop military trial for civilians, for example. People should be held accountable. You know, uh, people should have, have the right to exercise their basic rights, including the right to demonstrate. But these are, 
transitional justice, accountability, and then reconciliation and inclusiveness. What we see right now is in most of these countries is a systemic process of dehumanizing, stereotyping each other. You can disagree 100% with your ideological adversaries, but wh what are you going to do with them? They're part of society. You, know. you will have to find our challenge is to find a way that irrespective of the so-called our differences, not the superficial difference of color or race, but even ideological differences. We have to find a way to live together. Because if we don't, we will all lose. There's no question about it. And that's a different issue in this globalized world. So transitional justice, inclusiveness. And I think all these regimes right now are still in the mode or state of mind that we can still prevail over our adversaries. Nobody's going to prevail. I think that is, that's the bottom line. Nobody's going to prevail. What we really need at the end is it, rather than saying, I'm going to squash this or crush that, is to find a way, how could we coexist? That's a key issue. And I hope we should not continue to have more bloodshed. You know, I hope we do not repeat the European experience of 300 years you know, and of all sorts of, you know, religious wars, First World War, Second World War, you know, what have you. But then again, to discover at the end that there's no other way that to live together after we lost millions and millions of people. But in that process also, we should not forget that they, they have gone through the Renaissance, the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, which basically the rational thinking Emphasis on the human dignity and emphasis on pluralism. That, in conjunction with all these wars and violence, they have also have been going through that. And they have been going also through reformation, you know, Luther, you know, and uh, they have gone through reformation, you know, protest, you know, as it, until they find a way again to, to be able to, to understand that, irrespective of our beliefs, we still have to be, find a way, you know to live together. We need, I think we need to do, to go through that in, uh, in the Arab world. We need to, one of the key issues I think is religious reformation. We haven't, I mean, it's, it's sad to see everybody and his brother now talking in the name of Islam, starting from ISIL to Al Qaeda, you know, saying, you know, carrying the so-called, we need a, to have a consensus on how you can interpret a religion in context in the 21st century. And one of the issues basically, which is still plague our part of the world, is what extent is the role of religion in public and private life? And how much state should be involved in that process? That's a question that has never been resolved in, I think, 14 centuries. But we still have to start, because that issue continues to plague us in, you know, in, in, in many parts. We need to restore law and order, because without law and order, there is no economic progress. And without economic progress, you will continue to have a breeding ground for extremism. You know, I always say again that poverty is the most lethal weapon of mass destruction because poverty comes with it injustice, in, you know, marginalization, anger, all, all sorts of things. So unless, to my mind, you know, the key challenge in the Arab Spring countries is economic and social development. Get people jobs, get people hope, get people dream, and a lot of this extremism we see will evaporate. That's at least my, my, my view. Uh, we need to build civil society, you know, because without civil society, you know, thriving civil society, parties, you know, NGOs, human rights organization, you cannot move, you cannot move forward. You need to build state institutions, again, that has been quite weak, quite corrupt, completely. You know, and you need to build again a, the state and institution where citizens should again be able to identify with the state. I will end with two things that one of them is, is, is probably optimistic if you look medium term, long term, that the culture of fear is gone. You know, that is something which, which we see everywhere, that the idea that a ruler, a dictator can squash people is no longer there. 
people have gone, the young people, have gone through prison, have gone through torture, have gone through everything. So they know what it is. But they still determine to, uh, because they think their life is not worth living unless they, they wrench their freedom out. And so the culture of fear is gone, and that, with that, to me, is, it's only a question of time before, before they, it's, only, it's a, only also a question of attrition, because, you know, 60% of the, pe of, of, of the of people in, in these countries are under 30. So it's a question of attrition. 10 years from now, most of these rulers are no longer there, and for good cause, you know. And, uh, but they need to be prepared, and that's what I keep telling them. I mean, it is not that you will take over, but you need to be prepared to take over, which means you need to be educated, you need to understand the world as it is today, uh, and that is, again, I put absolute emphasis on education, because education is the key to a lot of the stuff. In education, which would allow it to compete, which allow it to organize, which allow you, you know, to do what, to move forward. Without education, it is not there. <coughs> And that's what I, you know, when people say, you know, what can the rest of the world do? The rest of the world can do a lot by soft power. And that is basically is to me, is invest as much in education. Invest as much in spreading the values of enlightenment. Invest as much in making people understand that you are linked with them on the basis of human solidarity. You know, I think, and that's something the West need to understand, that they need to create the, the feeling or the conviction that we are, we are not really necessarily in an inherent clash of civilization. This is junk. Uh, what we are is we have different cultures, but we are very much complementary, and we're becoming more complementary, and we need to reach out to each other on the basis of human solidarity. And that, that's another topic I'll talk to Jim about when we talk about wars, we talk about collective security. But that is our hope, is human solidarity, that I should care about everybody, whether he is in Libya, whether he is in Darfur, whether he is in Rwanda, the same way I care about what's happening in New York or what's happening in Missouri. You know, the same. It's the same human lives I need to care about. Final thing I, I should say is, in my view, the middle, the area is very much imploding, melting down, if I borrow some expression from my former job. And uh, <laughs> what, you, what you need is, to me, is a peace conference that deals with all these issues. You know? A peace conference that, because you cannot de-link the Palestinian issue, from regional security, which means ethnic sectarian issues, uh, conflict with Iran, uh, the arms race, extremism. I mean, all these issues, if you look at it, are and nation building. You need something, in my view, something to what happened in the, after the First World, World War here, you know, the Versailles meeting. You, know, that's, you need an all-inclusive peace conference you know, where everybody should be there, all the big players and all the players in the region, including the Iranian, the Turks, the Israelis, the Arab, because you cannot de-link these issues and you cannot leave the situation to fester the way it is right now. We can't afford, as a matter of ethics, as a matter of human survival, to continue to leave this region the way it is right now. Thank you very much. <laughs>